I'll speak first a little bit about sort of um, our experience in sort of developing and then evaluating this longitudinal nutritional counseling curriculum for our internal medicine residents. I'm sort of joking to uh, Rena earlier and, and others that I feel a little bit like a fraud being here because 99% of the work was done by Colin. So I'm very uh, proud of what he did and so very privileged to speak to you about um, his great work. For those who didn't know or don't know Colin, uh, he was a student, a resident, a chief resident here, and after eight years at Sinai, moved back to California where he's a GI fellow at UCSF. Bridgen sends along his apologies. He's stuck at a, a conference, um, which didn't sound very interesting. It sounds like he'd rather be here with us, so um, I will present for him as well. And so no, no possible disclosures. I have no disclosures. Um, and so sort of by the end of my sort of 10, 15 minutes, I want um, you to be able to describe the development and implementation of the longitude nutritional curriculum for internal medicine residents. Um, and I think as sort of Bridget and I were thinking about sort of talking to this group and presenting the work of a trainee, I thought we felt like it was a good opportunity to sort of reflect on the role of mentorship in trainee project development. I think, um, you know, Colin did really incredible work, but I think there were sort of key steps along the way where we played roles of sort of varying importance. And so as we talk through um, the project from sort of beginning to end, I'll try to sort of on the left side talk about what we actually did, and on the right side talk a little bit about sort of mentorship lessons. So just to be clear, the things we talk about in terms of lessons are not at all specific to Colin, and many of these things he actually did. I think these are just things that Bridget and I felt like we had to learn working with students and residents as they tried to design, implement, and then really evaluate projects uh, that had an educational basis. And so sort of starting from the background of kind of the why, I think we kind of all know why, but um, obesity is rampant. So we know that 38% of the U.S. adult population is obese. Looking at sort of clinic-specific data for our residents, over half of all of the adult patients in our clinic are overweight. Um, and I feel like I was surprised the number was only half and not like two-thirds or three-quarters based on sort of our experience. So USPSTF among all groups recommends screening adults for obesity and guidelines from basically every conceivable society recommends screening for obesity and then attempting to do something about it. And so we perceived, and sort of Colin most strongly perceived, that there was really low levels of resident comfort with sort of nutritional basics, um, and that lack of comfort really hampered their ability to sort of counsel patients um, and really do nutritional assessment in their patients. Uh, and again, like I said, there was sort of low levels of perceived comfort. So thinking sort of more about sort of our, our general needs assessment really pushed Colin to sort of figure out what was happening here. Um, and previous to this work, we had three hours of didactics spread throughout training, um, which looking back on them were of high quality and very highly rated, um, but had very poor connectivity. Um, we felt like we were delivering a curriculum. Our trainees did not feel like there was a curriculum that existed um, because the sessions were not explicitly linked together and they didn't build upon each other. Um, and we, looking through those, looking at the objectives, 100% of our objectives were sort of cognitive. They were all sort of knowledge-based, nothing really at the sort of application or higher levels. And then thinking about sort of our ideal approach going to the literature, the answer is who knows. Um, the quality of literature and sort of the ambulatory setting is regretfully relatively poor in the internal medicine world. Um, and then specifically speaking about nutrition, basically nothing. Um, the only study we could find at the time that we started doing this was this Burton study from 2011, where they had a three-hour workshop with satisfaction level outcomes. The survey is done like 10 seconds after the workshop completed, saying that people learned something, but no real attempt to see if anyone did anything with the knowledge. Subsequently, there was a, a second study published that basically did the same thing. And sadly, or not surprisingly, after two hours of kind of massed practice all at once, there was no long-term behavioral change, which we might have sort of suspected. As we were sort of thinking through this with Colin, some sort of lessons that came up. Um, so one is sort of like encouraging him to sort of make the case. So we feel like we already knew this, um, but I feel like he, like many trainees that Bridge and I have worked with, are so eager to sort of jump into it sort of pausing to sort of make the case, do the background. Understanding what exists, I think for many trainees, they feel like they've been through it so they know, um, but things are always evolving, so having to sort of slow the process down, making sure we truly understand what exists in our current approach so we can really add on things rather than duplicate. And then ideal approach um, is holding off on jumping right in, doing a thorough lit review, utilizing things like MedEd Portal, and then when all else fails, sort of going to educational theory. 
And so for us, that's where we started designing this project. Wit review, not helpful. Meted portal, zero submissions relating to nutritional counseling. Um, so really had to go back to sort of educational theory, sort of grounding in sort of behaviorism, um, experiential warning theory, and then I guess adult warning principles um, to really sort of guide what we were doing. So thinking about how we move to sort of like behavior level outcomes early on, and we'll talk about our objectives in a second. In terms of sort of our next step, a targeted needs assessment. So informal discussion with our didactic instructors, why didn't their teaching work, which was an interesting conversation for a resident to have with an attending, but uh, one that I think was ultimately quite fruitful. Uh, and then discussions with residents and sort of uh, Collins mentors. We did a sort of pilot survey before. We didn't use our initial targeted needs assessment for our pre-test for our evaluation. We did a more sort of pilot version of a needs assessment to get baseline satisfaction, knowledge, self-assessed skills, and self-assessed behaviors, which not surprisingly uh, confirmed what we had thought, which is people didn't know anything, didn't do it, uh, and didn't have much confidence in their ability to do it in the future. In terms of our, I'm glad, actually I'm glad they had no confidence because they didn't know anything, right? So they appropriately lacked confidence in their, uh, in their skills knowing nothing. Uh, in terms of objectives, um, I won't give you all the objectives for all of our talks, um, but really from the beginning our goal was application, having them do something with this knowledge. Uh, and so our aim was sort of application, so think very critically about sort of our objectives. Uh, in terms of our sort of mentorship lessons, so involving stakeholders, I think this is a real challenge for trainees involving stakeholders who are attendings. Um, so I think we really pushed Colin, and I think it, it worked really well, and something ultimately was very comfortable with talking to sort of attendings, didactic givers, faculty, uh, about sort of what they were doing and what didn't work. Especially for trainees project scoping, I think lots of folks in this room have worked with trainees, very, very big projects, very limited time scope because their training will end and everyone always thinks we'll stay here forever like Colin did and then he matched at UCSF and he's gone. Um, so appropriate project scoping was sort of important from the beginning. And then I think like all of us, thinking about verbs carefully with objectives, but sort of moving on just sort of like obsessing over what verb you use and more about sort of like what level you want. And so I think we were trying to be clear up front that we want application. Uh, we want application of this knowledge and we wanted to see behavioral change, which really sort of bled into the way we thought about our evaluation. In terms of our, our sort of methods, I and mean, then I'll talk about sort of how we evaluated this and what we found in terms of outcomes. So um, we ultimately decided, and I'll talk about why in a moment, to do three sessions. So we had sort of a fixed amount of curricular space. We couldn't expand. But we wanted to do three sessions eight weeks apart um, for a longitudinal component, with each session sort of uh, relating to the previous, reiterating key points, and then generating opportunities for application and practice. Um, so within the curriculum, there was an initial didactic component that was knowledge-based, interactive discussion, role plays that were skills-based, and then assigned counseling and sort of debriefing, which is a more sort of process-based outcome that we tracked. And so sort of mapping out the curriculum, what it looked like, an initial session on sort of the fundamentals of nutrition, more didactic based on nutritional assessment, nutritional basics, and then weight management basics. And then sort of pause for eight weeks, a sort of brief summary to start session two on the sort of key principles of session number one. Um, and then uh, jumping right into role playing after a brief review of motivational interviewing. And then ending with sort of discussion of their panels, discussion of their patients, discussion of potential barriers, and then leaving with an assignment. And their assignment was to counsel a primary care patient that block. So we got like the second day of the block, so they had 10 more days to do this. Counsel primary care patient on nutrition, have them follow up in the very next block um, to sort of talk to patients. And so their task was when they saw the patient for the second time, they were not only supposed to follow up on one, what changes the patient made, but ask the patients for feedback on the quality of the counseling that they had done to see whether the patients felt like what they said was realistic, what they wished their doctors had done differently. And so we gave them a very specific script um, that they were supposed to use for this. The last session was kind of a debrief, um, which we had to sort of call and script out um, to talk about their experiences for their barriers uh, and, and was sort of a call to action to do this for other patients. In terms of sort of mentorship lessons, so thinking careful about sort of a longitudinal and linked curriculum, we feel like we had the little data we had from the literature session that sort of masked practice all at once was not effective. And so spreading out the curriculum and looking at two concrete actions using mixed methods, so not just didactics. I think it's true of all trainings I've worked with, but I think we really had to sort of 
push uh, Colin to be okay with putting near peers out of their comfort zone. I think especially for trainee products projects, they really want people to like it. I mean, we all want people to like our teaching, but they really want people to like it, and so they're really afraid to do anything aside from a PowerPoint or worksheet-based lecture that puts people on the spot. Um, so um, a lot of reassurance that putting people out of their comfort zone with role plays, with discussion, putting people on the spot, making them do stuff is okay. And it turns out it was, as we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then for us, from the mentor, and thinking about sustainability, knowing what Colin was not likely to say at Mount Sinai for the next 50 years, thinking about sustainability from kind of minute zero, and, and really pushing him to write up detailed scripts for all of this. So all the slides were annotated, all of the discussion was a scripted discussion um, that we could pass on to a new faculty member and have, um, so this sort of project lives on despite him leaving the institution. In terms of our methods, and then the next slide is our results, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so we did baseline surveys uh, and sort of post-curriculum surveys given to the residents. Um, and the post-survey was then eight weeks after the last component, so seeing if there's any retention of knowledge. So pre, and then the post was eight weeks after the last thing, so spanning about half a year from pre to post. We had questions assessing knowledge, attitude, and confidence and skills, scored on a one to four Likert scale labeled strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. And then we asked residents the frequency of encounters in the last outpatient block in which we perform nutritional counseling. Again, giving numeric scores to percentages. We linked pre and post test by identifying code so we could see um, specific changes from within one resident. Uh, for mentorship lessons, so early IRB, so it was kind of a pain to get through. Um, for reasons I still don't totally understand, the IRB didn't love a lot of what we were doing, but uh, it happened eventually. Uh, In-person surveys, so no resident in our program at least responds to SurveyMonkey, so again, emphasizing it's okay to like bother people in person with in-person surveys. And then again, thinking critical about ways to think about behavioral change. And I think we'll, I'll mention at the end some sort of like next steps or things we wish we could do. I think what we would have loved to have done is direct observation of our residents getting feedback from patients. And we couldn't logistically figure out a way to make that happen. I think that'd be the next step is more direct observation and moving away from sort of self-assessed uh, and EMR tracked behaviors. In terms of our results, uh, we had 44 second year residents divided into four groups. Um, we had a reasonably high response rate, especially on our sort of pretest. Um, and then in terms of satisfaction, our kind of lowest level of Kirkpatrick's pyramid, uh, we had really high training satisfaction, which I think was a real reassurance um, after our concern that all this role play uh, would be sort of poorly received. In terms of what we found sort of pre to post, um, so again, the score is sort of strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. Our baseline for most things was somewhere between two to 2.5, indicating either disagreeing or uh, sort of half agreeing, half disagreeing. Uh, and so um, our biggest change was in percent of encounters engaging in nutritional curriculum, um, so increasing about um, 0.7, um, so moving from sort of like one to the next, so significantly increasing their self-report of counseling. For all the others, increases by about 0 0.5, again, moving most of the post-test results to three or above, suggesting they agreed or even agree with a mix of strongly agreed with our statements. And so the, the main ones I've chosen to highlight here are their self-assessed comfort with discussing, discussing nutrition and weight loss, their confidence, behavioral counseling, and motivational interviewing skills, and their sort of ability to prioritize nutritional counseling with obese patients. So again, all attempts at getting at sort of like self-assessed behaviors, though no true objective markers of actual behaviors in clinic due to our sort of inability to do direct observation. We tried tracking initially sort of EMR documentation, uh, but uh, a more global problem is we document terribly. So both the pre and the post results were like awful, so we sort of discarded that as an evaluative method in the end. Um, in terms of sort of lessons learned from a mentorship perspective, so again, reinforcing that change improvement is hard. So statistically significant, though relatively small, um, but pretty good return on three hours of curricular time in terms of changes in self-assessed behavior. And then again, always having ideas for sort of next improvement, iterative improvements with the curriculum, which I think Colin was sort of able to do. Um, so in the end, we felt like our sort of three-hour curriculum longitudinal skills base was able to result in a statistically significant improvement in self-assessed skills um, and increases in behavior. 
So the, the one outcome I didn't measure is process, um, which is we had 44 residents att attend all three sessions, not surprisingly, since we control their content. All 44 attended, so no, no truancy there. And then all 44 were able to do a write-up at the end about the patient they counseled. So all 44 completed kind of the process um, of the curriculum going through from knowledge base to actually putting it into practice with a patient. In terms of conclusions, I think I sort of already mentioned all of these. So at baseline, our residents had little training in nutrition and behavioral counseling, and that our sort of pre-existing curriculum had relatively limited connectivity between sessions and relatively poor ability to push those skills into the clinic. The short curriculum was well received, resulted in significant improvements in confidence and self-reported behaviors. Um, and that um, I think we all sort of agree with this. Realistic and supportive mentorship is important for the successful implementation of educational initiatives. Um, I think we'll actually just start with a couple questions for the group. <laughs> Who, as a parent, or, or just imagining being a parent, would think that they might have some questions about their parenting. And then who here who's done any pediatric training, it could even be in, in medical school, feel, felt like there was a big emphasis on counseling parenting about parenting topics and addressing issues related to sort of psychosocial development in their training. I found that too. Um, <laughs> and I remember actually, I must say, Lori and I actually started the faculty practice in Gen P's um, a while ago. And it was funny because we were very junior and people would ask us a lot of questions. I remember being like, oh my gosh, someone just asked me about their child like having tantrums. And, and I was like, why can't they ask me medical training questions? I can answer your ear infection question. And I just felt like I kept getting all of these questions that were very parenting and behavioral developmentally oriented. And then I also felt like, I was really good about knowing like bacteria that would cause neonatal meningitis and all these, you know, medical issues that we are trained so well on. Um, and yet often what I was seeing in the office wasn't, office wasn't the bacterial meningitis. And I was seeing a child who definitely had issues with impulse control and definitely there was a language delay, but what should I be saying? And definitely things seemed out of, control in the room with the parent reining in the child, but I didn't really feel like I knew how to handle those questions well. So with that um, need and collaborating with a lot of really fun, excellent people who are in this room in the corner here, um, came this vision for the Mount Sinai Parenting Center. And the Mount Sinai Parenting Center, the idea is people who are looking for answers for parenting questions often all people with children do usually go to the pediatrician. And so how can we make every pediatric healthcare interaction strengthen a parent-child relationship and help promote positive parenting behaviors that will help a child, hopefully in the 360 idea of well-being, which is not just physical, but mental, like social, emotional, cognitive development. And um, so with that vision came, hmm, how, do, how, how are we going to do this? Um, and, and again, sort of thinking big picture, a lot of it went back to how do we get trained? How do we learn about this? Um, and, and are we doing a good job training across the country um, on, on this topic of teaching parenting skills? And our goal for the Mount Sinai Parenting Center is can we really change things across the whole country, eventually the world, we just want to take over the world, um, but can we make a curriculum that actually could go to other residency programs can we do, can we change this pediatric healthcare, um, almost culture to value this. And so with that, we decided to start with a needs assessment of residency directors, because we thought residency is a time where actually a lot of your mindset is created and a lot of the training of how you're gonna practice as a general pediatrician occurs. So we decided that we would then go see if we could get the thoughts from pediatric residency leadership on how well they think they're doing these things and what's currently in place. And with that, All right. so, Deanna will with present. That. So we have no disclosures. And as Dr. Hammond said, um, our goal was before kind of making our own curriculum and thinking about how we can improve pediatricians' practice to really understand what the need is out there sort of beyond our own experiences of feeling like parents are coming to us with topics that we don't understand. 
Um, and the reason why parenting is so important, again, other than the fact that it's something that everyone has questions about, is that it has positive parenting has broad implications for a child's health overall. Um, so there have been numerous studies that have looked at positive parenting behaviors in early childhood and shown associations both with behaviors, children's behaviors, which makes sense, but also with physical health, um, with things like rates of childhood asthma, rates of obesity, um, have sort of all been linked to these, or these early um, sensitive parenting skills. Um, and as we said before, if pediatricians aren't taught this, they really can't provide that counseling. So we created a 21-item survey uh, designed to assess the attitudes of pediatric residency leadership about these skills and really to understand what existing parenting skills curricula are currently in practice. Um, to survey program directors, we use the APPD, the Association for Pediatric Program Directors, which includes both pediatric program directors, associate program directors, and some continuity clinic directors, um, and did the survey by email. Uh, so as I said, everyone who was surveyed was involved in pediatric program leadership in some way, um, with about 40% uh, practicing general outpatient pediatrics, and then we had a mix of hospitalists and subspecialists, uh, which was important to us because, again, we were really trying to capture what was currently happening in these programs. Um, about half were precepting in their continuity clinics, again, capturing sort of different group because that's often where these questions come up for trainees, um, and many were at academic universities. So the first thing we asked is sort of what we just asked you of what you see on the left. How important um, is training pediatricians on uh, parenting skills that would promote positive development? Um, and almost everyone said it was uh, important or very important, with no one saying it wasn't important. Thank you to our pediatricians <laughs> for agreeing with that. Um, but when asked how well their program educated their trainees on these topics, um, most did not think they did so very well. So a lot of people, 69% said moderately well. 20% um, said not very well at all. So again, to us, this sort of highlighted this gap of something we think is important, but we're not really training our residents in. When we asked program directors what were the reasons for the shortcoming, for this discrepancy that we saw in the previous slide, uh, the most common answer by far was that there wasn't an existing curriculum. So 86% um, of our almost 200 respondents said there wasn't a curriculum. Almost 80% said competing priorities, something all of us in medical education are probably familiar with. Um, more than half said that time was an issue. And then less important, but that something that still came up with everyone was a lack of faculty experience and concern that there wouldn't be faculty buy-in to discuss these topics over other ones. We asked about what would convince these uh, respondents to implement such a curriculum. And again, not surprising to this medical education crowd, 90% wanted it to be free. <laughs> Increasing knowledge and skills, something that could be integrated into the program easily, that addressed core competencies for the ACGME and also the uh, uh, pediatric boards, uh, also came up as, as keys to adoption of whatever curriculum we were to create. And then when we surveyed a little bit further about desired free resources, um, most people wanted learning resources for residents or some sort of self-guided learning module, which I think is very consistent with the barriers that we saw in the previous slide around concern for faculty buy-in and faculty time. We surveyed a little bit more detailed as to specific topics that these respondents would want covered in the parenting curriculum, and positive discipline came out at the top. 95% wanted that to be part of it. Sleep training, I see people nodding in the back. Sleep is a big issue. Um, Self-regulation, and again, as Dr. Hammond said before, things like tantrums that we just, many parents struggle with, and pediatricians often struggle with if they're not trained in how to help their parents with it. Uh, language development, toilet training, secure attachment, and then school readiness and literacy were all also very popular topics. Uh, so again, just to sort of highlight this, so the first question we'd asked about barriers was sort of why are you not currently doing these things and curriculum and time came up. When we asked about potential barriers to a new curriculum, we saw a very similar response. So participants were concerned about uh, resident time um, and again faculty buy-in and knowledge is a potential area of concern. So based on that initial needs assessment, we concluded that our pediatric residency leadership across the country values these topics, but don't feel like they train their residents very well. And that, for us, suggested the gap that we really expected to find based on our own experience. Um, and from that, we concluded that creating some sort of parenting curriculum that could be for residents specifically would fill an unmet need. Um, and we took this one step further, and this is what we're going to show you now, and actually built a curriculum kind of using these needs assessments to guide what we did. So this, hopefully, so this is actually um, 
the Keystones of Development curriculum, which um, was hundreds of hours of work and labor <laughs> and love. You, and you might notice the voice of of, of, of the voice artists here. Um, this, this was a very interprofessional creation, actually, um, from pediatricians, developmental psychologists, social workers, researchers in the field, experts. And um, the Keystone curriculum is currently being um, rolled out at Mount Sinai and piloted at now it's uh, now six other sites, so seven total. Um, and the residents are doing this, um, most are doing it during their behavior and development rotation, which is a four week rotation that everyone does their intern year. It often has a lot of um, free reading time, um, just by nature of um, that rotation. And so this is something we hope is meeting millennials in their learning space because they can do it on their own time. It's self-directed. You can do it on your iPhone. Um, and we really try to think about, um, we had actually done other processes where we had small group meetings with them and they, and they were like, well, what do we actually say in the visit and not just talking about parenting? And so with that, we actually created, there's an introduction, but there's six modules that focus on how do you actually in the room with a patient and a parent talk to them about developmental issues based on age. Um, and then uh, background, uh, there are six other modules which are called the science behind the keystones, which is really a deeper dive into understanding these sort of principles that we think that keystones were chosen based on things that they are important for child development and predictive long term of child um, success and they're things that parenting behaviors can affect. So we'll show you just a sampling of what was created. It's just going to take a moment. It's not the fastest log on here. Um, so the first we'll look at sort of the introduction to, can you hear it? Okay. Welcome to Keystones of Development. Leaving attachment, autonomy, and executive function into well child visits birth to five. This curriculum will demonstrate how you can promote early brain development and encourage strong parent child relationships within the structure of routine well child visits. Before we begin, we want you to know why this is so critical to your role as a pediatrician. Research tells us that a child's early experiences and the environment in which they are raised dramatically affect how well the brain, and thus the child, develops. A negative environment, one where the child is exposed to chronic adversity, such as neglect or violence, can cause a damaging stress response in the child. That stress can be toxic to developing neurons and actually alter the expression of genes, modifying the child's development and health in profound ways. The good news is that toxic stress so that's sort of the background. I'll show you one um, more of sort of the sample of the provider in the group in the visit with the child. Turned into practice. Today we're going to demonstrate ways to encourage that's positive right. development during the newborn one it's month and two months. Yeah. Helps children learn language much more easily. This introduces yep. new words, teaches yep. feelings, perspectives. So it gives a little background on topics that are discussed, and then it shows you in. And you probably do. It's very time consuming. However, feeding is also a great opportunity for you and Jaden to bond. So snuggle with him and try. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you get an idea. <laughs> this is what I'll say from that. Anyway, so there are different modules for each of the ages that talk about diaper changes and how to use that to engage with your child. Um, and then the other element of the course is the keystones, um, looking at the science behind it. And this really is going into what is secure attachment, what is autonomy, what is self-regulation. Um, it includes um, not only sort of, oh goodness, that's <laughs> sorry, here. Um, it talks about different research studies done, and there are also videos of experts in the field talking about it. Anyone who wants access to our curriculum, we'll give, we'll give you a login. And that was what was created based upon this needs assessment from the program directors. Um, so just to conclude with sort of our next steps, um, mm -hmm. as we mentioned, this is now being piloted 
um, both at Mount Sinai and other sites, we sort of similar to the work um, you heard from Dr. O'Hell before, have created pre post test surveys to help understand both residents' knowledge base at the start and end of this curriculum, but also things like their confidence in counseling parents and actual changes in practice. We've similarly had the question of how can you actually observe practice um, and are discussing that as well, but that's obviously much, much harder to do. Yes. Next, next year's rollout <laughs> is looking at patients' thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you.